All right, now we are moving on here to the chemical wetting of Christian Rosenkreutz, um, the foundational text really for Rosicrucianism, uh, and it clearly has a debt to John Dee as the Monus Hieroglyphica appears on the first page of it in one of the letters which the angel gives him. And this was published in 1616. It was written by Johann Valentin Andrei, although its existence was known to have been uh, real uh, or extant in 1603 when Andrei was only 17 years old. So whatever that early version of it was, uh, this is quite a precocious text for a 17-year-old to write. Um, and then, but it, uh, followed the conf the first two documents, the so-called Fama in 1614, which tells the biography of this character called Christian Rosenkreutz, who lived uh, for about 106 years in the 15th uh, century and over well, ending in 1485 with his death, and I think his birth date was 1378. So he lived lived a long life. If he was a real character, Rudolf Steiner insists that he was, but um, I'm I'm not sure about that. Um, and then so 1415, the Confessio then follows it in 1615, and then we get this imaginative thing. The, the other two texts are nowhere near this beautiful and imaginative and brilliant. This is a very dense text with lots of images compressed into it from the Hermetic tradition. Um, it's just chock full of almost every image we've been studying you'll, you'll find in here transformed somehow. Now there is a sevenfold model of alchemy. I think this I got this from Titus Burkhardt's book on alchemy. So we have seven days for the seven days of the week, but also for the sevenfold model of alchemy. We know about the threefold model that moves from negrito, blackening, to albedo, whitening, or purification of the metals, to rubido, the final uh, reddening, in which sulfur imprints a new color and hence a new form onto the metal. But there's also a seventh stage version. And this one, um, I believe I have connected these, uh, uh, each one of these to this, the seven days here. The first day is just quicksilver. It sort of combines all of them, like the prima materia. You, you start with, and this is definitely an alchemical allegory. Uh, you start with a, a substance of some sort, like in the book Mutus Liber, it was dew. It, the substance that you begin with varies, but it's always symbolized by Quicksilver or by the Ouroboric dragon. The second day corresponds to Saturn, which corresponds to the metal of lead. The third day corresponds to Jupiter, which is the metal of tin. The fourth day corresponds to the moon, which is silver. The fifth day corresponds to Venus, which is copper the sixth day to Mars, which is iron, and then finally the seventh day to the sun, gold, the production of the Phileas Philosophorum, although in this case it's the production of the king and queen, the sort of Adam and Eve figures that are produced through the alchemical transmutation processes. So here's an image of uh, what we see on the first day, um, the Quicksilver day. The philosopher Christian Rosenkreutz is sitting at his desk studying and preparing for Easter. Francis Yates says she thinks this takes place on Good Friday, uh, but the commentator to this book that I've been using, Bastian Bonn, who's the best commentator on this that I've found, says that it should be Maundy Thursday. The symbolism should come out that way. And um, so he's preparing. When there's a sudden wind that blows and this angel being shows up, she's bearing a trumpet and the winds have eyes because uh, the spirit is all seen. It sees your every move. It's always watching you and it is much more aware uh, than any individualized consciousness is, is aware of. And it brings the trumpet sort of like Gabriel because Gabriel blows the trumpet at the end of the, with the last judgment. So it's meant to suggest an enunciation like Gabriel comes in to give the message to Mary, not with a trumpet, but it's meant to connect to that. But Yeats says it's also the allegorical figure of, of fame uh, was personified this way. And uh, that would then link back to the Fama, the first of the texts that tell the autobiography of Christian Rosenkreutz. And then she gives him a message, uh, and says, which says that he is invited to a wedding, the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, and that he must be prepared for it. And then he sees the symbol of uh, John Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica there. <laughs> and the inscription is um, on the, um, the seal in hoc signo, plus Winkes, in this sign you will conquer, that is to say he will conquer the elemental world using D's sign here, which it is meant to transubstantiate. And then he uh, goes to sleep and he has this dream, a very interesting dream, that I think evokes the devil 
and the tower in uh, in the Marseille tarot deck, which would have been around, and I believe that this, uh, Andrei knew it. And so this here we have the image of the sort of the, the devil um, and the the damned in the tower, and Rosenkreutz is one of them, and they're all there are beings up above the an old man, uh, the wise old man, and uh, the woman who is Sophia, a personification of Sophia, or possibly Alchemia, uh, more likely Sophia, and they're dropping down ropes and they're pulling individuals up who are fortunate enough to be able to grab the ropes, and there are only seven of them. Some are left behind, and that's just the way it is on the spiritual path. Some people don't, don't have the, the patience or the discipline to make it, so they don't. But Rosenkreutz is one of the last ones uh, to then be pulled up from, from the bottom of the pit. Okay, so then we move to the second day, um, which is the day of the Negrito proper, led Saturn, um, the dream at the end of this chapter brings in a, a Saturn figure. And um, so this should be Good Friday. And then he sets off on his journey out, uh, the, the pilgrim on his way here, the pilgrim's progress uh, on his way out into nature. And the first thing he encounters is a dove that appears to him as he's taking a break. And he feeds the dove some of his bread. But then a raven comes up. And of course, the raven is always the, the, the uh, symbol for the negrito, the blackening comes up and steals the bread away from the bird, and he's watching this, so he goes on his way, and he comes to a point where there are three possible paths that he could choose. The first one is uh, very rocky, and this Rudolf Steiner in his commentary says corresponds to the way of the intellect. The intellect that is still bound to the senses is the thing that has to be overcome in order to receive spiritual visions, in order to receive spiritual revelations. You've got to get that intellect out of the way. So that path won't do, that's the rocky path. Then there's another path, which is smooth, quick, and easy. That's not the right way. He chooses the middle path, which is not too hard and not too soft, uh, just like Parsifal chooses the, the middle path in Wolfram uh, von Eschenbach. So he chooses the middle way, and everything is about moderation. He comes back at the end on a boat with the sign of Libra on it, indicating the balance, that uh, the proper way is, is the middle way, uh, the balance. And then so uh, then he comes to a first porter, and this porter uh, demands from him his letter of admittance to the wedding, and he gives it to him, and he says, great, now you have to exchange something for, for this token. You'll need this token to be redeemed at some point. What have you got? And he says, well, I just have this water. And he says, oh, fine, I'll take the water bottle. So he gives him the water bottle. Then he comes to the second portal, and uh, he has to offer the token there at that portal. But then uh, another token, I think, is sw swapped out for salt, which is what he has left. Salt is the third principle of alchemy that was added by Paracelsus in addition to sulfur and mercury in the 15th century, and it symbolizes the body. Um, so he gives him the salt. Then he comes to a, a third portal where there's a lion, and it's a, a roaring lion. That's, of course, a personification for silver. And But then there's a virgin and a porter, and the porter quells the lion, and the virgin shows up with a lantern uh, to light his way, and there are three temples that he comes across and sees, and here she is lighting as he approaches the third portal and his robe gets caught as the door is closing behind him and so he has to shed the portal. It's just like Anana when she's descending through the seven gates of the underworld, she has to give up something. It's the soul giving up one of the Vedantic sheaths, one of the koshas that are given up. Uh, the physical body first is given up, then the etheric body, then the astral body, and finally you're just left with the ego consciousness, the spirit that reincarnates in each lifetime. So he has to give that up, and he is also made to change his shoes. He has to get rid of his shoes, and then barbers appear, and he has to get a haircut, because it's like shedding a snakeskin here. You're leaving the, the world of the profane world behind and entering into uh, a new world. He also does have an image here where he sees two columns that I equate with the Boaz and Yakin column on the weight deck of the tarot cards, but there's two columns also on the Marseille deck. One is, um, I congratulate, and the other is, I condole. Same thing as, as chesed, I congratulate, or mercy, and, and it's opposite gavura, uh, severity, the, the um, severity, same, same kind of opposition. Uh, so that might be a reference to the, to the high priestess card. And the virgin herself who appears, when she first appears, she's dressed in sky color, that she may herself be meant to represent the high priestess card, which is what I suspect. So he comes in, uh, the barbers give him the shave. Um, and he comes in, and the, there are all these other nobles in, in there, nobles, emperors, uh, all kinds of people are in the main room. 
and they're all boasting that they know Plato's forms. One boasts that he knows about Democritus's atoms. They're all full of just boasting. They're just full of themselves. There's no humility whatsoever. Only Rosenkreutz is quiet and says nothing, and that's one of the signs of a, the proper spiritual initiate that he's on the right path, that there's a certain degree of humility instead of boasting. These guys aren't going to survive the weighing that will take place on the third day. And then so, um, then he is made to sleep out in the hall. She gives him the choice to either sleep in a designated room or out here in the, in the main entryway, and he chooses to stay in the main entryway. And then he sees um, another dream. So in this dream, and this is the Saturn dream, and why this day corresponds to the Saturn stage, obviously, is because he has a dream now, this time that's up in the sky, instead of down in the tower, it's up. he sees this, all these ropes, uh, men who appear to be like hanged men, and that would be the card of the hanged men. They're all sort of dangling from the sky, and then this Saturn figure comes along with his scythe and starts cutting them, cutting the, the, the threads, all, all the ropes, one by one, they drop uh, to the ground. So that's the, the Saturn principle of death, but it's also uh, cutting the intellect free from its ties to the senses, which is the essential thing that has to be done on the spiritual process, as Rudolf Steiner says, the intellect is only going to get you so far. The intellect bound to the senses, let's say, the the uh, sensory soul that's bound to the intellectual soul that has to be overcome with free will and the consciousness soul has to has to come in uh, to for one to be guided upon the path to the spiritual vision okay and then so we move then to the third day which then uh, is Holy Saturday and corresponds to Jupiter we're in the albedo process here we've moved from uh, there's all the uh, nobles in the court who are boasting and so forth and uh, now, the weighing is what takes place here. It's the primary thing. Um, <clears throat> the Virgin reappears, and she's dressed all in uh, red velvet this time instead of sky blue. And then there's a large pair of scales that's hung in the middle of the hall, large enough for a man to stand on against a stack of seven weights. Steiner thinks that the seven weights represent the trivium and the quadrivium, uh, logic, rhetoric, uh, logic, grammar, rhetoric, and then astronomy, music, mathematics and uh, I forgot the fourth one what is it uh, he has it in here Bastian Bond has it in here the um, grammatica dialectica rhetorica musica music arithmetica geometria ge geometry uh, and astronomy as something that the intellect has already should already have learned and mastered in a classical traditional humanist education um, but you've got to be uh, you, you've got there has to be some weight to you you have to you, you have to weigh heavier, actually, than that. Um, and all of these guys get on the scale one by one, and they're, they're all lightweights. They're all spiritual lightweights until Christian Rosenkreutz gets on the scale, and he he's, is the exact weight perfectly. And so this is, of course, the sign of Libra, but it's also the same axis that I've pointed out before of service to self versus service to others. All these guys are about service to self. Um, so they're, they're spiritual lightweights. Their egos are in the way. Uh, they're guilty of all kinds of the seven deadly sins, whoredom, adultery, gluttony, and other uncleanlinesses, as it says on the next page. Um, but because he was humble, um, he, he withstands the weight, and immediately the, a person says, that is he. And the virgin comes over to him and asks him to, for the four roses, He on the first day he had put four roses into his cap, so now he takes them out and offers them to her. So now he is in the role of giving. Thus far he has been receiving. He received the message from the angel for the invitation. In the dream, he received the rope that was let down to him that pulled him up out of the pit. And now, so now this is the first time that he's in the role of being able to give. That's the difference in the spiritual path, uh, service to others. And then so um, the, the guys who didn't survive the judgment are taken out into the courtyard. And the fame angel comes back in and reads a document. This is all very Jupiterian. This is the, the judgment and um, then uh, she basically says, says what their punishments are all going to be. And then the virgin comes out and breaks her wand, which is the symbol for uh, guilt for someone who is being who is guilty. And then uh, they go through various torments. Um, and then uh, after the judgment is over, then we have the vision of the snow white unicorn with a golden collar about his neck. And then a lion that comes, the lion with the sword that had first been met at that third portal. And the sword has to be broken 
And once the lion breaks the sword, that's the intellect, once that's broken, then the dove descends down with the spiritual vision. So that intellect has to be broken. And the lion is sulfur, of course, and the unicorn is a symbol for uh, quicksilver in its pure form. And so that's the, the image of the, the breaking of the intellect that has to take place. Then he's taken on a tour around the castle to see various things, such as a, a sort of a noble library. And then there's a giant globe. It's so large that you can get into it. And he steps inside of it. And bon, uh, Beston Bond points out that this co would correspond then to Holy Saturday, to the descent of Christ into the earth. Um, so I think he's right about this, with the, uh, the, the four days of Easter being connected to these first four days. So he goes in, and uh, there are some mysteries revealed about his position on the earth. Um, and he says, uh, I saw much more, too, upon this globe than I am willing to reveal. Let each man take into consideration why every city does not produce a philosopher. That is absolutely true. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and then there are various riddles which are propounded that appear to have no solution, which is precisely their point. Uh, with the intel, the intellect would always want to jump in there and find a solution. It's either this or that. That's the mental, rational structure of Gebser. Uh, but this is more like Aurobindo's overmind structure, where there is a, a suspension, or the integral structure, a suspension of opposing points of view, so that the validity, of, the validity of both viewpoints can be recognized. Um, okay, and then so we move on to, and here's the uh, the announcement of the verdict, with the fame angel coming in. And then um, the fourth day now is Easter Sunday, which is silver, the moon. This is the soul freed of its earthly attachments now. It's also the second phase of the albedo, the whitening, the purification process. I'll read, uh, Burkhart says, The lunar crescent has raised itself above the cross of the elements and has dissolved their oppositions. All the potentialities of the soul contained in the initial chaos have now been fully developed and have united with one another in a state of undivided purity. This is the outermost motif of solution, and it is followed by a new coagulation. Okay, and then so, with the fourth day, um, he comes in, and uh, we have the lover's card appears with the Cupid figure. Uh, the Cupid figure comes in, uh, and then we get the three th thrones. On, so here's the vision of the three thrones. And on each one of these thrones is a royal couple. So there are six of them, but there's going to be a seventh. And before the execution takes place, they're beheading. There's there's a, a festive play that's put on about a Moor who uh, has taken captive a lovely baby. It's a, it's a young girl. She represents the soul, by the way. And the Moor is the material realm, the dark realm realm, who takes her captive and then she is betrothed to uh, a king's son for, who was in that land before the Moor took it over and evicted her. Uh, and then they were betrothed and the Moor is overcome. That's, of course, the overcoming in hoc signo uh, winkes at the beginning. In the sign you shall overcome. Overcome the elemental world. And the Moor is a symbol for that. And then so as all six of these people plus the, the various courtiers, and there's a table between them on which there are these various elements. We have uh, the symbol of death with the snake of life moving in and squirming in and out of it. Um, we have a globe representing the, uh, the the entire celestial sphere, you might say, and then there's a mechanical clock on there representing time, and then also the candle, and then there's a little tiny, there's a candle or a taper as it's called, uh, that represents also time and the persistence of the spirit through time. And then also there's uh, a little fountain that's circulating blood through it that represents the symbol of life, but which is a foreshadowing of what we come to in chapter 6 when we get to the great transformation there. And then so they watch the comedy, and um, then after it, at the end now, um, the more comes out, the more from the play, the black man who was in the play, and he comes out and he has an axe, and there are six coffins laid out, and he chops off the head of each one of these six uh, ro uh, royal people and puts their bodies together with their heads in each one of the coffins and then puts some, th some implements in the coffins and then puts the lids on the coffins. So they represent the six metals. So in a way, we have, we have Quicksilver as the prologue to the other six, the transformations of the metals. 
And these are the metals. They're being personified here as nobility. But they're going to be transubstantiated, alchemically transubstantiated, as when we get to the sixth uh, chapter. And then so he goes to bed after this. He's a little bit upset by it. Um, and he can't sleep. These are scenes from the little play that they put on. Uh, and he can't sleep. And so he gets up and he looks out the window and he sees that there are seven ships uh, that are lit up with light that approach. And the coffins are all put on the ships. And then they're set free. So where are they going? So we'll find out where they're going to go in the next chapter. Um, the fifth day. So we move to the fifth day, which is the day of Venus. And here's the, uh, the island of Olympus with the tower on it in the background that they're going to be headed towards. So this is Venus, copper. Um, it's the first phase now of the Rubido, the greater work. Uh, the, the symbol for Venus is made up of the circle representing the sun, which is a symbol for the spirit, and the cross representing the elemental now. So we've moved past the development of the soul with just the symbol for the soul being the moon, and now the spirit is descending into, down to meet us, as it were, down uh, uh, in the elemental world. And so the fifth day is Venus Day, and it's on this day where um, he gets up early and the page comes in, and... Um, Too early and the page leads him down into this little crypt a sepulcher uh, and in the middle of it you find sort of what looks like the description of the tomb of Christian Rosenkreutz that is found in the Fama the first of the documents and then he the page then takes him to another area where he says then I saw a rich bed ready-made hung about with curious curtains one of which he drew aside where I saw the Lady Venus stark naked you could almost imagine her as Rembrandt's painting of uh, the shower of gold, uh, Dani, in, in her bed. For he heaved up the coverlets, too, lying there in such beauty and in such a surprising fashion that I was almost beside myself. Neither do I yet know whether it was a piece thus carved or a human corpse that lay dead there, for she was altogether immovable, and yet I dared not touch her. So she was again covered, and the curtain drawn before her, yet she was still, as it were, in my eye. Um, but I soon saw behind the bed a tablet on which it was written as follows, When the fruit of my tree shall be quite melted down... Then I shall awake and be the mother of a king. But now he's committed a violation here. He's torn aside the veil of Isis, you might say, pulled it aside, uh, sort of like what Psyche does in the Cupid and Psyche story when he's sleeping and she, and she goes, he's told her, you can never find out who I am or this is over. And she violates that with a lantern and goes in, draws aside the veil and peeks at him and then she's thrust into all her adventures as a result of that. So this is going to count against him uh, at, at the end, when, when we get to the end. Now then, so they all get on these boats, <coughs> um, and there are seven of them, so they correspond to the seven planets, so they represent time, but when they come back from the island, they will come back on twelve boats, which will then represent the twelve signs of the zodiac, and hence space, so that time will be transformed into space, ultimately by the end here. And they arrange the ships in such a way as they set forth to the island of the Tower of Olympus in a kind of pentagon shape. And then the the uh, the nymphs then the sea nymphs which I think Goethe brings these into Faust Part Two for all his sea nymphs in the classical Walpurgis Nacht that they sing they sing this great hymn to love uh, not better is on earth than lovely noble love whereby we be as God and no one vexes his neighbor so let unto the king be sung that all the sea shall sound we ask and answer you what has to us life brought tis love who has brought grace again is love whence are we born of love how are we all forlorn without love and so forth so it's dante's love that moves the sun and stars and is the primary thing uh, about all of this that we are doing in these incarnations is learning learning through service to others how to expand our ego um, not in the sense of more ego egocentricity but to expand it to include other people so that the service to self gets expanded to include a broader and broader groups, larger and larger groups of people until eventually the goal becomes one with humanity. Um, so that's what they're learning here. So they go to the island and they have to take the corpses out and do some preparations with them. There are virgins who come in and they're washing the bodies uh, and they're transforming them to bring a kind of distal, it's a certain fluid that they're going to use the next day as the prima materia. And so then that's it for the fifth day, which is one of the shortest of the days. But then so we get to the magnificent sixth day, which is the crowning achievement of the entire work. 
Um, and the resurrection, right? Okay. Um, and this is it corresponds to Mars now, with the symbol of the circle being, and the glyph being below the cross. Now the spirit is fully entering into matter and transubstantiating it. This corresponds to iron, and it's also the second phase of the rubido, which is now the coag coagulation. We've had the dissolution, we've had a miniature negrito in the previous chapter with the, th the six uh, people being beheaded. Uh, that's the torments of the metals, and it reiterates the negrito. And then so there are three ways. So once it gets inside the tower, uh, it's a seven-story tower, one story within another going up through seven stages that's meant to replicate the seven phases of alchemy uh, that the seven days represent. And there are, once again, three paths available, just like there were three paths available to him on the second day when he set out. And one path is that um, one way to ascend up to the top, and the Virgin is at the top waiting for them to ascend, so they have no choice, they have to get up somehow, is again a rope that dangles down, and the person has to climb up the rope and, and getting uh, calloused hands or uh, scabs or whatever it is that rope will tear up your hands, as anyone who's ever climbed a rope in gym knows. Um, it's, it's very difficult. But the other way then is the easy way, which in this case are guys with wings, and they just go easily. They fly up. And then Rosencrantz gets to the middle way with a, with a giant 12-foot ladder that he has to arduously climb all the way to the top. But that's his path, the middle way. Not too hard, not too soft. Um, and so when they get up there, then they're at the second uh, story. And then um, a um, giant sort of copper... Uh, Square-shaped copper basin is brought in, and Rosenkreutz knows through his intuition that the six bodies are hidden uh, with inside it. And then a smaller one is brought in uh, in a box that is actually the Moore's head. And so uh, they put the, the box with the Moore's head on top of this, and it ends up becoming three, three different levels. And there are these branches in the middle, which is, is the second level. These, these branches that they begin circulating this solution that on the previous day they have derived from the washing of the corpses and they circulate the solution through it and it goes through it and it gradually melts the six bodies and uh, and the head and once that's all done now they have another prima materia that they're going to use here in this process as they go th they go through this process and then they go up to the third floor and when they get up to the third floor there's a giant golden sphere that's there and there's a hall of mirrors that is reflecting the sunlight all around it. So it's very bright. And they bring that fluid with them and they inject it into the sphere. And then um, they're told to crack the sphere open. And so when they crack it open, there's an egg in there. And that's the philosopher's egg, of course, that we also saw on the cover of the Monus Hieroglyphica. The philosopher's egg, which is the symbol of the retort and the process uh, of what's going on here. Then the egg hatches and a strange magical bird comes out of it that they have to wrestle with at first um, and it turns black and it's uh, it's chaotic and wild. So that's ne the Negrito and then it uh, whitens and then it transforms into the swan. So it moves from the, the raven to the swan, which is the albedo and it goes through a transformation there and then it, have to, it ultimately it has to be transformed into the pelican, which because it pecks at its own breast, the blood there symbolizes the red, uh, the reddening process of the rubido, but then it will have to be melted down. So that will be the phoenix process of melting it down into ashes. So they put it into this vat, and um, when its feathers fall off, so that it has a completely naked body, the feathers when they go into the, the, the bath turn the waters blue, and somehow they extract from that a blue rock, which they then use as pigment to paint the body of the bird blue, except for the head. They paint everything else blue, and it comes out. Now it's more civilized, but someone has to offer to chop off its head. So one of the companions of Rosenkreutz comes forward, chops off its head, and then they have to burn the body. And before that, they, had to, they need to extract the blood um, and then burn the body and transform it into ashes. And from those ashes, then, they need a kind of dough. There are these two molds, molds as though you were going to make a human statue. Um, two human molds. And so then they pour that ash dough into the two molds, one female, the other male, and they clap the lids on them. And then after a while, they bring they, they open those and there are two perfect small human bodies. 
which they have to feed. So this is the king and queen who are going to be married. Sulfur and mercury, uh, the spirit and the soul, uh, the sun and the moon, and so forth. Plug in whatever dichotomy you want. So you can see then that the ultimate production here of this sort of Adam and Eve process, which is the production of the homunculus, um, and this is alluded to in uh, James Whale's film, The Bride of Frankenstein. He, he gets the, the alchemical symbolism of the process of making the homunculus perfectly. Uh, that's what this process is. So you see then that those three royal couples have been beheaded, broken down, put through processes of transubstantiation and alchem alchemical transformation until they have produced these two highly uh, distilled beings as the symbol for the rubido the reddening, the production of the lapis, whatever you want to call it. And then so, Rosenkreutz and his companions are invited by the Virgin up to an eighth story that they didn't know was there. So now he's at an octave. In other words, he's gone through the process of purification and torment and suffering, uh, and now he's completed the process, and now it's at an octave. But they're able to look down. And in order to animate these beings, three trumpets are brought in, and the small end of the trumpet that you blow into is inserted into the mouth of, of the two of them. And um, fire comes down through a hole in the top of the tower and enters the large part of the trumpet and goes into them and animates them. But it's done three times. So they already have a physical body there. So then my suspicion is that what they're putting in the other three times is first the etheric body that animates them, the astral body that gives them waking consciousness, and then the ego that gives them waking self-conscious awareness. Um, so that's the whole alchemical process here that's beautifully de described in this chapter that I think is absolutely amazing. And then finally we get the last day, which is uh, almost an epilogue. It's, um, that's the climax of the whole process. It's shorter, the, the Sunday, the gold day, third stage of the rubido, the last, the seventh day. So they sail back in ships, and his ship that he's on has the astrological sign for Libra. Uh, it's 12 ships, each one ha bearing one of the astrological signs as they sail back. to um, and, and he disembarks near the first portal where he had first entered. And he comes in now to this person and has an interaction with him. And the interaction is such that he says, Some, somebody has violated Venus. And he doesn't know who it is, but he needs to know who it is because... He was put there. He himself, the porter, made this a similar violation. And so he, he had to do penance by being installed at this portal. And he can't leave it until someone else who has done a similar violation of Venus comes to the portal and replaces it, like the myth of the golden bow. And then, so Rosenkreutz knows he's guilty, but he, at first he doesn't want to say. So he, he neglects to mention it. And then they go in with the king and the queen who have had their wedding now. They've been alchemically purified and transformed. And Yeats thinks this may be an allegory for uh, uh, Friedrich V, the, uh, the elector of, of Palatine and uh, Elizabeth Stuart, and their sort of magical castle at Heidelberg, because she brought with her the whole Elizabethan John D. tradition uh, into Heidelberg, uh, which her father was totally against being a, a witch hunter, obsessed with demonology. So it's loosely based on them and their fets and festivals and masks and so forth that they put on there at Heidelberg. So, and then it's mentioned again at the table, the violation of Venus, but then uh, the Rosicrucian order then has these five principles to it. <coughs> and um, it says uh, that, one, you, my lords, the knights, shall swear that you shall at no time ascribe your order to any devil or spirit, but only to God, your creator, and his handmade nature. In other words, this has nothing to do with demonology. They're not conjuring down demons. They're conjuring angels with magic. This is black magic. Two, that you will abominate all whoredom, incontinency, and uncleanness, and not defile your order with such vices. In other words, transform the seven deadly sins of the Muladhara chakra into the upper chakras, uh, the seven virtues. Three, that through your talents will be ready to assist all that are worthy and have need of them, one version of that, I think, in either the Fama or the Confessio, was that they would perform medicine on people free of charge. Uh, four, that you desire not to employ this honor to worldly pride and high authority. And five, that you shall not be willing to live longer than God will have you do. Uh, so don't look for things in a materialistic way, like trying to lengthen your actual physical lifespan. You've missed the point. These are like the cryogenic idiots uh, that have no belief in the afterlife, so they think somehow they can be reincarnated if, if their heads are preserved cryogenically, which is complete idiocy. 
Um, so none of that. And then so he then, his conscience calls him after he hears that, and he confesses to the, to the sin of the violation of Venus. And so the king says, well, um, I hate to do this, but you have to take over the porter's role because that's the tradition, that's the way that it has to go. And so it ends um, with him and a, the character named Atlas, who's been here all along as a, as a kind of minor character, um, representing s spiritual strength. Atlas comes in, and the king, and him, and in the last sentence, there's a, a, a lodging. I was conducted by both the old men, the lord of the tower, and Atlas into a glorious lodging in which stood three beds, and each of us lay in one of them where we spent almost two, and et cetera, and it says there are two quarto leaves missing, which may or may not be true. I get the suspicion that it's a conceit uh, that Andre E. has, has written in here. So um, that's it for the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, and I look forward to discussing all this with you in class.